So this is going to be a very long episode guys. I like to start by apologizing. You can always click on the timestamp in the description below to go straight to the video that you would like to watch. We started by talking about a Nigerian woman, Natasha Akpoti, who fixed a federal road from her own pocket. Also, I talked about what's happening in Ethiopia, especially based on feedback that I got from Ethiopians about the ongoing war. Ethiopians versus Western media and their coverage of the ongoing war. And of course, I introduced you to a course on depression and mental health which can help a lot of people also please follow us on facebook twitter and instagram and if you like this episode please share share with other people on your social media network call it all please roll the camera your girl Adeola move closer move closer guys I'm so excited about this my first story so my first story of the day is another reminder that you do not have to be in politics before you can make a difference and ladies and gentlemen I have talked about this woman in the past but please meet my mother Natasha Akpoti the 42 year old ran for Kogi governorship in the last election and incumbent Jaya Bilu was declared winner but I had her on the show before the election uh, it was live so you guys were able to ask her questions from different parts of the world thank you for that but that's not why we're talking about her today. Ladies and gentlemen, whoa mama. Are you guys familiar with the Igara Ibilo Langpese Road in Kogi State? It's actually a federal road. It goes from Kogi to Edo to Abuja and so on and so forth. So that road has allegedly uh, not been fixed in 30 years plus. So this road is so bad that you actually cannot drive through. <laughs> Drivers of regular cars apparently spend days on this road while truck drivers spend weeks just trying to get through this road. I spent almost five days here. People going to Abuja, to Lagos, spend many days here. It's not just filled with mud, we're talking about sinking mud. Because of this, armed robbers and kidnappers frequent that road, especially the places that are bad, knowing fully well that the drivers, the passengers, cannot escape. The 1.4 kilometers Igara Ibilo Lampese portion of the Kogi Edo Boundary Road was regarded as a death trap, having been left abandoned by the government for years. Motorists and commuters typically spent days on the road with attendant loss of man hours, damaged vehicles, exposure to kidnappers and a host of other dangers. It was indeed a traveler's nightmare. Guys, this is a federal road. I'm like, how, who, what? Well, guess what? Natasha Akpoti has fixed the road. Whoa. But the story is different now. Thanks to the efforts of social activist and politician Natasha Akpoti. On that road, they rob some of our people. People abandon their vehicle, abandon their uh, bike, and trek to the other side. And we met hundreds of other vehicles, mm. falling trucks, containers were lying about, and everyone seemed comfortable. Hey, you need to see how the people of the community uh, in that area celebrated this woman. By conferring her a chieftaincy title. <laughs> Well, well, you know, I wish that I could just drop the mic right now, right there, you know. And this is not just about the failure of the Nigerian government, but even the big construction companies that we have in Nigeria, like Julius Berger, all those international companies, they could have fixed this road. So, guys, I spoke with Natasha because I anticipated some of your questions. I can see some of you at the back of the TV, the back of the phone, having some questions. So, I anticipated some of your questions. So, I called her, I spoke with her. But now, I wish that it was a live interview so that you guys could also ask her questions but anyway the first thing i asked her was which i believe some of you are dying to ask her this is a federal road why did you do it especially because the last time we spoke you said you're no longer interested in politics you said you're no longer interested in running and i don't blame her because they almost killed her at that time remember they burnt down her office we talked about it they harassed her physically in the presence of the police the dss the commissioner of police they were all there that day when they harassed her pushed her down and all that nobody did anything Anything. Nobody protected her while she was being attacked by APC thugs. She said, there comes the prostitute. Look at Natasha Ashewo. Natasha Ashewo, get out. You are not wanted here. He came and pushed me to the floor. And I tried to stand up right there outside, just beside me, opposite, on all sides, were just the policemen holding guns. 
Not one of them stopped these dogs or came to my rescue. So I said to her, with all the pepper that they showed you in Kogi, why did you fix this road? And I'm not saying that she shouldn't tell before you start misinterpreting me. In fact, I'm inspired that she did this. I'm so, so glad and so grateful that she did. I just know that some of you would want to know. That is why I asked the question. So she said that first of all, being a federal road, the part of the road that she fixed is not in Kogi state, it is in Edo state, you've already left Kogi state. And so the people of the community in those area cannot vote for her, trying to tell me that she didn't do it for the vote. That's the first thing she said. Second of all, she said more importantly, she decided to do the road after she traveled on that road and her car ended up spending four days in the mud. So they had taken her, I guess, by Okada across, but her car was stuck for four days. And because she has a construction company, please underline that, that Natasha has a construction company and she has the funds to do something about this road. She did it and she did it in three months. If you find yourself in a position where you can make an impact, please do not hesitate. You don't have to be in office. You don't have to hold a position of authority. You can make an impact of service on a project. Yeah. So she said that it took three weeks just to clear the abandoned vehicles on that road, many of which had been there for months. She said that when they were clearing, they found five containers that had fallen over when the trucks tumbled. Also, among the vehicles that they pulled out in that three weeks, they pulled out two of Dangote's trucks. It's not all in one spot, but there is at least one kilometer that is completely bad. So altogether, about 1.4 kilometers was really bad on that road. I said, again, are you saying anybody can fix a Federal road in Nigeria without any wahala. And she said as soon as she started fixing the road that some officials showed up <laughs> asking what rights do you have? Who gave you the permit to fix this road? Please forgive me, Nigerian road officials, in case you guys are watching, <laughs> you know, do well. But I find this very insulting, okay? For years, you guys did not see this road. You refused to fix the road. The people of the community cried out. So tell you did not see them, you did not hear them. You did not do anything. But the moment somebody decided to fix the road. You showed up. Ah, ah, ah. Hey, they roll on. Are you why are you not afraid? Can it be you? You go more yes, so now the funny thing is, move closer. You guys will not believe this, but I'm very sure that the road would have been contracted to somebody a long time ago. As a matter of fact, they would have probably written done and commissioned at their office. It's probably done on paper, commissioned on paper. Somebody has pocketed the money. And these people did not do anything at that time. Even though they didn't do it, oh, they will say it is done. But the moment she started doing it, this, the same officials they showed up. Oh, yeah, came over there long. Why would you even go there? So she said they came and they asked for money for her to get permit. She refused. <laughs> She said Biko, she refused to pay them a dime. But what helped her, according to her, is that the people of that community, close to the bad part of the road, she said that the people were very supportive. Uh, first of all, she said they stood up against these officials. They were like, she's not paying you anything and this road must be fixed. So they stood up for her. Also, someone donated a three-bedroom apartment for her workers. The women in the community were cooking for them as they were working. They killed goats. They killed rams. Some of them brought akara. They even provided vigilantes to protect her workers especially because her workers were working day and night so they stood their ground and eventually the officials stopped coming she said that if she had given out money when they came uh, some other people would come they will also ask for money. And then they will come. They will say, well, you still need to pay so, so, so for the apartment to be released. She said so she did not give anybody any money. Anyway, she said that the mud was so deep, they had to dig out hundreds of yards of mud, which took forever. They removed all the mud, which they now filled with rocks and stones. So she said that alone took two months. She said she did this so that the road would not sink after like five years of fixing it. She said that she then did three layers of asphalt. Three, not one. Normally, some people do one. She said she did three. So what she spent on the road could have fixed about five kilometers of road. So I said, how much did you spend, my sister? How much did you spend all together? She said, <laughs> She said in total she spent about 310 million naira. I said, Jesus, Jesus is Lord. What? Ah, Baba. <laughs> That's about $750,000, guys. Of course, I know what your next question would be. 
listening to her. I said, Natasha, <laughs> I said, remind me one more time how you made your money because the people will say, so what does she do? And she said to me that she's into real estate, that she's actually been into real estate since she was in college. She bought her first property when she was in college in Abuja. And she's also into oil and gas. And she also has her own construction company, like I said earlier, which made things easy when it comes to construction that road. Uh, Natasha has her own equipment. She has over 30 pieces of equipment in her company and she deployed all of them to the site. Uh, so she said to me that she wouldn't have been able to do this road if not that she had the equipment, that things wouldn't have moved as fast, which made it possible for them to work day and night. So she was constantly fixing this equipment as well because they were constantly breaking down because of how bad the road was <laughs> during the project. And she said to me that she kept fueling them as well. So I said, you spent 310 million naira. She said when she actually started, she thought that this would take about two weeks to fix and that she would spend maybe 20 to 30 million naira. But that when she finally realized the amount of work that needed to be done and the amount of money that it would take, that uh, by that time she had already started and she couldn't pull out because the hope of the people of the community had been raised. Also because of her integrity. That's what she said. She said she needed to finish what she had started. So that was how 20 to 30 million naira turned into 310 million naira. And so the work continued and in three months the road was done. I know that I always say on this show that you don't have to be in politics to make a difference but this is on another level guys what this woman did i'm like what god bless you nata i'm like big time seriously me i'm saying prayers for you a road that the government did not fix for decades in three months this woman did it and she stood her ground against those wanting her to pay for a permit to do what they refused to do. Can you imagine? And then she said that Fashola has sent uh, delegates after she was done to inspect the road and those people said that she challenged them. She also said that she has never met Fashola by the way. I think this is a slap on the face of the federal government and even the state government. I mean, I know that this is a federal road, you know, and, but the thing is if the federal government would not do it and it's been there for decades. The governor of Edo State, for example, where the bad part is, could have done something. No offense to the governor, but I uh -uh. It's not fair now that people are traveling, they are stuck on your road. Armed robbers, kidnappers are coming and you are aware of it. And if the governor of Edo State refuses to see the road, what about the governor of Kogi? Why didn't my father, Yaya Bello, sorry, I know the man is busy trying to become president. He actually believes he will be the next president. <laughs> Baba. So the man is trying to be president by fire by force, but we're not talking about that. <laughs> He could have at least gotten the permit to fix this road on behalf of the federal government and then send them the bill. Abi is easier for a governor than uh, someone that is not in office. And we have so many wealthy private citizens that could have fixed this road. Don't you agree? Because when I heard that uh, Dangote's truck was stuck there, for example, I was like, ha ha, Dangote being my father. <laughs> I said even if he doesn't want to fix the road, he could have pulled some strings to ensure that the road is fixed. He's the richest man, not just in Nigeria, but in Africa, amen somebody. We have so many big people like that that could have fixed this road. Why didn't they see the road? Like, um, please know that I'm not picking on my uncle, uncle, you know, you know, in case you're watching, sir. Especially because he's from Kogi State, not Edo State. So it is not his responsibility, but still, let's talk about it. But if you calculate the amount of money that that my uncle parked inside his garage. Okay, so okay, okay. all those luxurious cars that the man has, 27 of them as of the last count some years ago, including one in his parlor. That amount of money would have fixed this road a long time ago. Again, I'm not picking on him and I'm not comparing them. No, no. It's just that my uncle always knows the right thing to say. <laughs> But when it comes to doing, although he, re he renovated some schools in his constituency when he was a senator, but nothing like this kind of project. He did not embark on a project like this. Please, I'm not campaigning for Natasha Obif because I know how some of you think. And I did not collect one naira or one dollar from Natasha. Like, uh, once again, I just know how some people, <laughs> some people always believe that uh, you collect one. No, no, no. And if she decides to run for office tomorrow, because she, she may change her mind, I don't know, and she wins and becomes governor or something, I will still be watching her on Plasma TV like other politicians, ready to say, Auntie, uh-uh, this is not what you promised. No, 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 you cannot do us like that. I'm ready anytime, any day, you know? Once you're a politician, always a politician. That is my, <laughs> that is my own. Auntie Natasha, no vex. It is what it is. I'm always watching you on Plasma TV. So please, before you start yabbing me that I'm campaigning for her, no, 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 I'm not. But this thing she did, we must talk about it. Ah, it is very inspiring what she did. Unfortunately, though, a lot of Nigerians are not ready for progress. <laughs> 
they are not. You know when she ran the last time, they were saying stupid things like, oh, she's a woman. They were calling her a prostitute and so on and so forth. But whether you become governor or not, Natasha, please know that you've changed many lives. And also, I'm hoping that her story would inspire someone today that is watching me. First of all, you don't have to spend 310 million naira before you can touch lives, before you can make an impact. She could, that's why she did it. But what is it that you can do to make life easier for the people in your community or the people in your network or the people that came in contact with you? People should be better off just because they came in contact with you, not feel miserable. So if what you have, for example, is a pure water factory, every now and then, maybe once a month or something, please give out, even if it's just 10 bags of water to the needy. Everybody can do something is what I'm trying to say. Please don't just watch this story of Natasha and you know, you can write however you feel about Natasha in the comment section, but after yabbing her or praising her, please do something as well to touch lives. In fact, if you would, I would love for you to do something you've never done. Sponsor a child if you can afford it or children if you can afford that. This coming Christmas, don't just kill a goat and finish everything with your family. At Ishodo, we have done Christmas. Sometimes you need to actually see people and not just drive by them. You know, give out something to the less privileged in your neighborhood and in your community. I remember talking about a Ghanaian teacher on the show who went beyond teaching her subject in class to noticing that some of her students were absent because they could not afford school uniform. And so she decided to do something about it. She started sewing uniforms for them with her sewing machine. Today, her story has traveled far and wide in different parts of the world. People have talked about it. Lastly, can the big construction companies in Nigeria please do more in giving back to the people? I know that constructing roads is part of the government responsibility, but some of these foreign companies get government contracts in billions, and so they should also give back to the people. If the government will not do it, they can do it. So if an individual can fix this road in three months. My people, needless to say, I feel like thunder needs to fire some people, some officials in Nigeria. I'm sorry, I don't know how else <laughs> to say, ah! You'll be giving us excuses about why you are still struggling with the Lagos Ibana Express with all this year. Since I was in primary school, they've been fixing Lagos Ibana Express. So, ah, thunder will fire some of you. I'm sorry, I'm not cursing you out. I'm just telling you what will happen. <laughs> If an individual can fix a road within three months, please, what is your excuse? Nigerian government, federal government, state government, you should be ashamed of yourselves. You guys now don't know much. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. Moving on to Mali, in a previous episode, we talked about Francophone African countries, people of those countries, not the government, but the people rejecting the presence of French troops. Now, this is an update. In Mali, the last French troop is living after nearly nine years of being stationed there. In 2013, they were in four major cities in Mali. They were in Tesalit, they were in Kidal, Timbuktu, and Bamako. But it seems like they have been pulling out for a couple of months now, actually. It didn't just start. Now, and finally, the last troops is leaving, and maybe because of all the protests that have been happening in that region. But the interesting thing to note is that it seems like now the people, the Malians, want Russia as an ally in order to keep fighting the Islamists that are still in that area. Let me know what you guys think about this. So on Tuesday, the French flag was lowered and the Malian flag was raised in its place at a military base where they used to have nearly about 3,000 French soldiers, but because they've been pulling out gradually, they now have about 150 French soldiers left. Now, the rising tension has also come at a time when anti-French sentiment has become widely popular among Malians, who are accusing Paris of failing to contain the escalating violence and pursuing hidden agenda. So, the French military already has shut down its bases in different parts of Mali, uh, like further north in Kidal and in Tesalit, but it is still maintaining its presence in Gao. Lastly, some people are saying France will still be present, just in a different way. As a matter of fact, this French uh, general, the chief of the Bakhane operations in Mali, also said that in an article. So, what do you guys think about that? Please leave a comment below. We would like to hear from you guys. You guys now don't know much. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. 
to Ethiopia guys, I like to first of all apologize to Ethiopians follow me on Facebook because I asked them for their opinion on the ongoing war and that same day actually based on your feedback on my Facebook page we actually shot an episode with an Ethiopian story updating people about what's happening in Ethiopia sharing your opinion. I went on Facebook because I do have a lot of Ethiopians watching the show and I asked Ethiopians what is the truth and I tell you the comments they were very interesting <laughs> and I got to know how some Ethiopians feel about your girl. <laughs> But that was a month ago. I'm so sorry that we were actually transitioning into a new editing software at that time. So it led to some tech issues uh, with the footage. So I didn't want to reshoot because it was already edited with pictures and videos. The guys in here, they've put in hours of work in it. And so I didn't want to reshoot, to redo the whole thing. So we kept trying to fix it while I was shooting new stories because we kept having breaking news. Like the NSAS report in Nigeria, the election in the Gambia and so on and so forth. So I'm I'm so sorry, it's not like you guys are not important. You are very, very important. <laughs> it's just that I was hoping I would have to redo this. But here we are, trying to redo it again because we were not able to uh, use that. Anyway, so just so you know, when it comes to Ethiopian story, sometimes you need to drink something. <laughs> before you talk about Ethiopia because it's very complicated I'm not talking about I'm talking about drinking water water or coffee that is what I have in mind preferably Ethiopian coffee anyway so we were only able to fix it uh, this week but by then there had been updates on the stories and so so I only uploaded the Nigerian story in the last video which I'm sure many of you are wondering why only Nigerian story because other African stories had changed so please please do not be upset that it has taken us this long to come back to Ethiopia I'm really sorry about that now for non-Ethiopians ever since we started reporting about the ongoing war in Ethiopia, there has been mixed reactions from Ethiopians about what is actually happening on the ground. And that's why I'm calling the title of this uh, video, Ethiopians versus the Western media. So my last coverage based on reports by the UN, by Reuters, CNN, and so many other media organizations was the story that the TPLF, the Tigrayan forces, fighting against the Ethiopian government, that they were getting close to the capital Addis Ababa. That was what I reported based on the UN's report. So when that episode came out, Ethiopians said that this is not true. So then I went on my Facebook page. If you're not following me on Facebook, like seriously, why? You should join us, you know? And also please subscribe to our YouTube channel. So I went on Facebook and I asked Ethiopians to please tell me what is true since I'm not on ground in Ethiopia. And I got so many comments from Ethiopians, which I am extremely grateful for. Thank you so much, Ethiopians, for taking the time to answer your girl like, who am I, you know? Please, if you're watching me on Facebook, by the way, don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything but it helps me with views and it helps me with my YouTube ranking. So I will be reading some of the comments that I got from Ethiopians that day but in summary this is my understanding of what is happening. I think number one a lot of Ethiopians believe that the Western media is not being truthful in their report of the ongoing war that their story is one-sided and biased and also based on the comments that I received from Ethiopians that day many of them believe that the Western media is trying to push a narrative that paints their prime minister as a bad person and then paints the opposing party, the TPLF, as mere victims. Another observation from the comments that I got from Ethiopians that day is that some of them believe that the West, especially the US, has a vested interest in Ethiopia and so they are supporting the TPLF. Some Ethiopians also said the TPLF that was in power for about 30 years had an alliance with the US. So in this war, the US is supporting the TPLF. So I want to address these issues briefly, starting with a quick disclaimer that some Ethiopians would not like what I would say. Some of them will like what I will say but honestly my goal is to be objective because I, I don't belong to either of the sides and like I always say on this show I really don't know anything I'm open to learning from you guys so let me start with one of the comments that I got on Facebook on that day and this one is from somebody named Mulugeta Kasai and this person said there is a coordinated media campaign against Ethiopia major pro Ethiopian Twitter Facebook and YouTube accounts are banned we are well aware of what they did to Libya Yemeni, Iraqi, and we're fighting back as much as we can. They literally forced their own narrative against the will of the people. And let me read another comment. This is from somebody named Getish Bahaini. And this person said, trust me, Adiola, the reports made by CNN, BBC, Reuters, ETC is completely fake. All the reports are a US backed. You know US is trying to dismantle our motherland, like what they did on Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, ETC. The truth is that TPLF, the Tigray 
uh, People Liberation Front attacked the Ethiopian Defense Force stationed in Mekele, the capital of the Tigray region, on November 24, 2020. And then the government is undertaking law enforcement measures. So this person is saying that the ongoing war is just a law enforcement measure. U.S. is helping the terrorist TPLF. This is 100% true scenario in Ethiopia. I will be reading more comments later on, but first of all, I believe that the U.S. has vested interest in every country. I may be wrong, but that's what I believe, and I believe the U.S. will always protect its own interest. Now, I personally think that the problem started when it comes to Ethiopia. I think the problem, the recent problem started when the U.S. sided with Egypt on the issue of the Nile River. You guys know that Ethiopians are constructing the largest dam in Africa, but both Ethiopia and Egypt have been in conflict over who owns the water. Don't forget that um, Ethiopians were not complaining that the U.S. had a vested interest in their country, at least recently, until that happened. You know, they didn't say that when their prime minister came into power in 2018 and the man was being celebrated all over the world. He won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2019. Nobody was complaining at that time. Every Western media celebrated this man, including all the Western media that Ethiopians have issues with right now. People were listing his achievements when he came into power. But when the U.S. president at that time, uh, Trump, decided to side with Egypt on the Nile River. He even suggested on video that maybe Egypt should just blow up the dam that Ethiopia had built. That was awful. We all condemned it. And so I think that's, that's the beginning of some Ethiopians hating the U.S. in recent times. I'm not talking about past issues. So I'm saying all this because I think that some Ethiopians believe that the U.S. government actually sits down the media in the U.S. and tells them what to report. But that's not true. I'm not here to defend the Western media or the U.S. media. But I'm able to say this because I live in the U.S. and I see the freedom that the press has here in the U.S. The U.S. media can be wrong. I'm not saying that they are not wrong. In fact, they've been wrong many times, especially when it comes to how they portray Africa sometimes. So I'm not trying to defend the U.S. media. They also painted it as if the TPLF were about to take over Addis Ababa, which I reported based on their report and the U.N. report, but they were wrong. It's been a month now, nothing has happened in Addis Ababa. The U.N. can also be wrong. But it's not like the government of the U.S. sits its media down and says, this is what you should report about Ethiopia. Again, I'm not saying that the media is not biased. Even here in America, you can tell which media is in support of the far left or the far right, which media is a democratic, which one is Republican, and which ones are objective, you can tell. But they choose that on their own. From what I know, living here, the American government doesn't say, oh, you have to be democratic or you have to be Republican. Although I feel like once they made up their mind, they they tend to stick to it, like Fox, you know Fox is a Republican, CNN, you know that they are Democrats. So I cannot speak for other Western countries because uh, I only live in the U.S. because I know that people are saying Western media, Western media. But the freedom of press in this country is why the media here can say whatever they want to say about any president, any U.S. president. I mean, you saw it happen during Trump's time. They said everything you could possibly think of about him at that time. And even with Biden. So the media here has freedom to not just say things about other countries, but about their own government as well. Again, I'm not here to say that the media is not biased in itself or that they are not biased in their coverage of Ethiopia. I'm just trying to address the notion that maybe the government in Western countries sat down with the media and told them this is what you should report. If you've seen any of the late night shows here in America where they roast politicians in this country, you would know that the U.S. doesn't censor its media. Meanwhile, this is from somebody named Jamal Yusuf who says, Adela Fayemo, denial is always common in Ethiopia for everything. The report is really true. The Ethiopian government is targeting Oromo and Tigrayans and arresting them in mass for the survival of his power. Like I said, it's been mixed reactions, as you can tell again. But I think that we can all agree on one thing, that a war is indeed going on in Ethiopia, which we were told at the time that it started that this won't take long. It will only take maybe like two weeks and it will be over. Now, the only thing that I don't agree with right now is the fact that some Ethiopians are saying, well, all the Tigrayans region are 
they are just terrorists and the government is just trying to eliminate terrorists. I believe both sides have killed innocent people. I don't think the government is completely innocent. I know that the war was instigated by the Tigrayans. I, I reported that when, when they instigated the war, we reported that on this show that they are about to start the war. I'm also well aware that in June of this year, the government of Ethiopia said that they were seizing fire. They were ready for peace. I reported that on this show. The TPLF refused to embrace peace in June when the government was ready for peace. But at the same time, both sides have killed innocent people. It's not like the government is completely innocent and it's not like everybody in the Tigrayan region are all terrorists. Nobody is sure exactly how many people have been killed, but thousands of people have been killed and many of them innocent people. More than two million people have been displaced. We see them, we see the videos. And this is one of the things that really pain me. Rape has been used as a weapon in this war. So many women have been raped to death. Some women were raped and then killed. We've seen videos, we've seen, you know what I mean? So it's not like, oh, they are just trying to eliminate some uh, terrorists. No, a war is actually going on. And I feel like sometimes when we're not directly affected, we tend to not acknowledge what some other people are going through. That's my biggest problem with us Africans. What some Ethiopians are, however, not happy with is the Western media painting the TPLF as mere victims and saying that they were getting close to the capital Addis Ababa to take over. That is not true. First of all, the TPLF started the war. We all know that. I have talked about that several times on this road. And also, they were wrong saying that the TPLF is taking over Addis Ababa. They are not. Life goes on as usual in Addis Ababa. Uh, there was, there's no war going on in Addis Ababa. However, in that same article, if you look beyond the headlines that they use, that they're getting close to Addis Ababa. In that article, they actually explain that they've taken over some towns on the way to Addis Ababa, but that doesn't mean that they are close to Addis Ababa or they are about to take over Addis Ababa, but they had taken over some towns. Once again, please, I'm not here to defend the Western media. I'm just trying to explain some things. But I'd like you guys to take a look at some of these videos where people are saying that there's nothing going on in Addis Ababa. I'm in Addis Ababa for the last four days. Uh, it's a beautiful city with beautiful people, and the reports that most Western media are putting out are not accurate. Addis Ababa right now is peaceful. So this is one of the responses that I got that day on Facebook that was very helpful. This person basically suggested that I watch this video of this uh, Ethiopian journalist, this woman who is actually Tigrayan. She lives here in the U.S. How she explained the relationship that the U.S. had with the former government, the TPLF, that is now fighting with the Ethiopian government, and why she believes that the U.S. is still siding with the TPLF. Well, my guess is that the U.S. is going with their old partner, right? TPLF was their partner for a very long time, from 91 to 2018. That was the, the, the group that led the coalition that ran the country. I'm sure there's a lot of personal relationships, a lot of financial uh, gains. Please try and watch the entire interview if you can. I watched the interview. Thank you so much for sending it. I also got to know how some Ethiopians feel about your girl. <laughs> First of all, there were so many nice comments from my Ethiopian people on Facebook that day and I'm so grateful. Some people talked about how they love me. Seriously, your girl loves you too. I'm, I'm grateful. Somebody said that they composed a poem for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Honestly, I really appreciate all that. But like I said, some people were not that happy with your girl, and they let me know how they feel about your girl. Like this comment by somebody called Melkamso Abate, who said, Adeola, the problem with you is that you always believe what the slave masters say. <laughs> Jesus, we don't expect you to believe the Ethiopian side of the story because we have not been your masters. But I advise you to use your mind and your heart instead of your tongue and your egoistic attitude. Okay, wow. <laughs> I'm a slave of the Western media, Lord Jesus. And I have ego, say what? Wow, thank you so much, uh, Melcam. So I really appreciate it. I honestly appreciate that you took time to write something. Like, for, and please know that I'm not offended at all. I've been called worse. At least you were expressing your opinion. It's so funny that maybe this person didn't know me uh, when I started talking about Ethiopia several years ago, especially when the TPLF was in government and I was always talking about the atrocities of the TPLF government and so on and so forth. But regardless of that, thank you for your comments. Let me read one other comment before I now conclude this whole thing. I'm sorry that this is so long and especially non-Ethiopians. I'm really, really sorry that this has taken so long. This person is called Anthony Akomia and they said as a blogger why not go to Ethiopia and find out the truth by yourself 
rather than peddling news that you are not sure of. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs> Once again, to all the Ethiopians that commented on my Facebook page that day, honestly, I appreciate you guys. Like, it's something to read about what's happening, but it's something else to hear from the people that are from that country. It makes a huge difference, so thank you so much. So to the last uh, comment, Anthony Akome, it has actually always been a dream of mine to travel all of Africa, and it will come to pass someday, inshallah, by the grace of God. I, uh, I'm honestly really looking forward to that someday. But you know, one of the reasons reasons why I started doing this show is for Africans to know more about what is happening in other parts of Africa. You know, as a Nigerian, I am ashamed to say that I did not know anything about other African countries until I left Nigeria, actually. It was when I got to New York and met people from other African countries that I started knowing what was happening in other parts of Africa. I met people from Tanzania, Sudan, South Sudan, Kenya, South Africa, Botswana, Cameroon, Ethiopia. It's so sad that even Ghana, our next door neighbor, I didn't know anything that was happening in Ghana. I mean, it's better now, especially with uh, social media. You know, at that time, we didn't have Facebook, we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have WhatsApp. So when I left Nigeria, we didn't have those things when I left Nigeria. So I had no clue what was happening in Uganda, for example, in Botswana, for example, you know. And the more I talk to my new uh, friends, my fellow Africans that I met in New York, the more I realized that we actually have more in common than our differences, including our political struggles. It's so, so similar what we face in so many parts of Africa. And that's why when I started doing this show, I didn't just want to talk about Nigeria, where I'm from. I wanted Nigerians especially to know what's happening elsewhere as well. You know, a lot of times we Nigerians no offense, but I think sometimes we Nigerians, we think we are Africa. We think Africa is us. <laughs> now and then I will see a Nigerian say something like oh I'm the first to do this in Africa I'm like no nah, you don't know much about Africa so um, I'm not a blogger I'm a journalist and I know that I try to make you laugh but my training my first and second degree they are both in journalism so because sometimes I feel like people expect me to just focus on positive things in Africa which I do I talk about positive things a lot on this show but I don't look away when people's rights are being violated I report everything that I can uh, because not everything is good and I cannot pretend that all is well. And no, I do not have any masters. <laughs> I am not, I am not anybody's slave. Nobody tells me what I say on this show. Yes, I studied in America and I live in America, but I don't even work for a US owned media company. Nobody tells me what to say on this show. I work for myself. Some people say that I sell stories to Western media. I'm like, wow, wow, <laughs> how do you even do that? And I'm sure enough, when I started reporting about other African countries, I also got backlash from those countries. How dare you talk about my country? Just face your own country, your country is corrupt. Which is true, you know, but that's why I always start with my country, Nigeria. I always start with Nigerian stories in every single episode. So I hope that someday we Africans would know that we are not each other's enemies. I am not your enemy. Please know that. And no, I am not being sponsored by the West and I'm not here to defend the West. And I hope that we will know someday that we have more in common than us borders, our ethnic groups, in our languages. The beauty of doing what I do online is the fact that the comment section is right there. People can always comment. It's instant, instant feedback, which I do not take for granted. So and please do not paint it as if I'm against you. I am not. But enough of my preachings. More importantly, this war has to stop. It's been a year now. The opposition said that about 52,000 civilians have been killed. But the prime minister said that that is not true, that it's not up to that. So what exactly is true. What do you think could be done for the war to end if one party says they are ready to end and the war and the other party is saying no? In any case, thanks so much guys for your patience. I know it's a very long story. I'm really sorry about that. You guys know I don't know much. Guess what? I'm just keeping it real. So guys, I'm really excited about this ad that I'm about to do because I feel like anybody and everybody can benefit from it. We've all had a really rough year, a really rough 2020, rough 2021 for some people, especially because of COVID. So many people have gone through a lot. And so in the year of 2020, for example, depression rates around the world skyrocketed to a high level. Approximately 280 million people around the world suffered from depression with several millions of people suffering from various mental and emotional illnesses. And that's 
that's why I'm really glad that I get to advertise this for you. This is not a laughing matter and a lot of people will write things off and say, oh, you just need to get serious spiritually, you know, talk to God, talk to pastor. All these things are great, but sometimes the church may not address what you're going through. I mean, I know some parents who have special need kids and that has changed them. I know some people who lost loved ones and that has changed them. You know, some religious organizations unfortunately may say things like, uh, it's God's doing, I'm alone, or you just have to accept what God has given you. But People are suffering inside, they are dying inside, which is why there's nothing wrong in seeking professional help if you're going through stuff. And so ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you guys to a woman called Lee Nathan. Uh, she is the founder of TLN Writing Company. But more recently, the, her company has branched out into writing courses on mental health, mental health, uh, depression management, and so on and so forth. So this course has three main goals. First of all, is to educate people who are not familiar with mental health issues, especially us Africans. A lot of people don't talk about mental health issues. Amen, somebody. Second of all, the, the, the purpose of doing this course is to help with the stigma and the taboos that comes with the subject of mental health and depression. Some people feel like, ah, once you talk about mental health like that, you know, there's, also, there's always this taboo around it. And the last thing is to encourage those who are suffering from mental health and from depression on how to get help. So guys, the best part of this is that this mini course developed by Lee Nathan is free. You only pay if you want more beyond the free course. So really, you guys have nothing to lose by checking it out. I know Miss Lee personally. She's someone that I can vouch for. You don't need to put up her picture. They will start thinking that I'm short. You know how I feel about that. <laughs> but if you contact her, please let me know. Uh, I, I need feedback on, you know, when you contacted her, how it went. All right, guys. It's been real, and I'm keeping it right up in here. This has been a very long episode. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> please don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have to subscribe to my channel, I'm still watching you on Plasma TV. Please press the subscribe button. It's right there and the bell button it doesn't cost you anything until next time i'm gonna see you later peace out